the main section today is going to be on does science lead to atheism? And this is unfortunately quite a common theme on social media, it's quite a common theme amongst different atheist activists. They make the claim that because science is progressing and we have these amazing discoveries and scientific theories and conclusions, we don't need God anymore. And therefore, he's, he's irrelevant or he doesn't exist. Also, some would go a little bit further and they basically would say that, well, since we have science now, and science doesn't really, can't prove God, right? Or can't show God's existence, then God doesn't exist because science is the only way to form conclusions about the world and reality. Now these assertions are false assertions, and these assertions are not even academic assertions per se, but they resonate on social media, and people have been taking these assertions quite seriously, unfortunately. So what we're going to do is unravel some of these assumptions and in the process of doing that we will be empowered to understand some key things about science and some key things about the philosophy of science so they have, they become, they, you have conceptual tools so you could have the right concept so when you get new questions when you interact with people you'll be able to answer those questions you will be able to answer those questions, inshallah. And the questions that some of you raised yesterday, you will automatically know how to address them yourself because you have the concepts, you have the conceptual tools, okay? So the three main things that we're going to cover, number one, does science lead to atheism? And number two, does science disprove religious claims? So, these two questions are broad questions, and within them are other questions, but if we address these broad questions, you will get the concepts that you'll be able to use and apply, and be able to answer any questions you haven't heard before, but related to the same topic. Right, so we're going to be dealing with these two main questions, right? So, the first assertion is science leads to atheism. Now, not, people won't say that directly, but it's assumed. And they basically have this at the back of their mind, even at the front of their mind sometimes. And this argument that, oh, you know, science leads to atheism is based on four false assumptions, okay? Now, these four false assumptions are going to give you really good concepts that you could address most things to do with science and religion and God's existence. It's not just relating to that assertion. And this is why this has been developed, that if you understand these four assumptions that we're going to go through, it will give you the concepts that you can use to address these type of questions concerning religion, God, and science, okay? So, here are the four false assumptions. Allah. Number one, science is the only yardstick for truth. You have some people saying, I don't believe in God, I believe in science, right? And they imply that science is the only way to run the truth about the world and reality. This is actually, in academia, laughed at. It's called scientism. Scientism. Scientism is the perspective, is the idea that the scientific method is the only method to use to find about reality, the world, and truth in general. This is a false presupposition. It's a false assumption which we're going to discuss. So why does that assumption lead to denial of the divine? Because people would argue if science is the only yardstick for truth and using the scientific method you can't find God, therefore God doesn't exist. That's the false assumption, okay? The second assumption. Since science works, its conclusions must be true. And if these conclusions are true and he can't conclude God directly, then God doesn't exist. It's fuzzy logic. It's imprudent. Is that a good word to use? <laughs> it's imprudent, right? It's unwise. It's, it's, it's not good logic, right? And they really argue this because they have a logical fallacy that if something works, therefore it must be true. Okay? Assumption number three. Science leads to certainty. And if science 
cannot conclude God, therefore we are uncertain about God, because only science leads to certainty. Again, this is false. We're going to go through various issues concerning the philosophy of science, like the problem of induction, which shows to us that science is good, it's beautiful, but it doesn't lead to certainty from the point of view that it's never going to change and it's an absolute truth. Science doesn't do absolutes, which is one of the beauties of science. Number four, the other assumption is they conflate philosophical naturalism, which we discussed yesterday was the worldview, the philosophy, that there is no divine, no supernatural, everything can be explained by physical processes. They conflate this with methodological naturalism. Methodological naturalism is the perspective that for anything to be science, anything to be a scientific conclusion, it cannot refer to God's divine activity or power, which is fine because they're not denying God, they're just saying, well, if, some, if something is going to be scientific, just don't refer to God for its conclusions, but you can still believe in God. So let's break these down. But before we do so, let's quickly talk about what science is. Right, science is not one direct observation. Let's just be clear about this. When I say that is a wall, and the wall is brown, that is not science. That's just an observation. Science is when you have at least more than one observation, and you start to reason over those observations. And you have a question, for example, and you want to find something out, and you have multiple observations, and you start to reason and find any causal links between those observations, or an explanation that adequately explains those multiple observations. So, the word science comes from the Latin word scientia, which means knowledge. And Bertrand Russell, I think he came up with a really good summary of what science is. Now, by the way, in academic philosophical discourse, they're still debating these issues, <laughs> yeah? Like science and, you know, what is true science, the demarcation problem, all of these things, blah, 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 blah. But this is just a summary for you, okay? So Bertrand Russell said, science is the attempt to discover by means of observation and reasoning based upon it, particular facts about the world and the laws connecting facts with one another. So you have observations, observable facts, one, two, and three, and you reason over those observable facts, one, two, and three, and you're trying to find out some laws or some kind of connections. So, let's deal with the First assumption, is science the only yardstick for truth? Well, the first thing you need to understand, the statement itself that science is the only yardstick for truth is a false statement. It's something what is called self-defeating. Because if science is the only yardstick for truth, and the statement, science is the only yardstick for truth, is true, then science should be able to prove that statement. But you can't prove that statement. And that's precisely the point. So from this point of view, scientism is actually self-defeating. It's like saying there are no sentences longer than three words. What's the problem with my statement? The statement itself is longer than three words. The statement itself is longer than three words. There are no sentences longer than three words. It's a self-defeating statement. Likewise, saying science is the only yardstick for truth is a self-defeating statement because the statement itself cannot be proven by science. So, let's now discuss why Scientism is false. Why the view that science is the only yardstick for truth is false. The first thing to understand is science has a lot of limitations. If science has limitations, then the statement science is the only yardstick for truth is not completely true because it can't address all knowledge. The first limitation is is that science is limited to the observations that we have at hand. The atheist philosopher of science, Professor Elliot Solberg, he said that in his essay Empiricism, 
that science at any moment in time, scientists at any moment in time are, are basically dependent upon their observations. They're restricted to the observations they have at hand. Limited or unlimited observations. So at any point in time, science is limited to a limited number of observations at a limited level, right? Because what kind of level observation do you have? You know? For example, we can't see the whole entire universe, right? So you're already limited from that point of view. So science is limited to the observations that we have at hand. And there are some things that just can't be observed. Like when you try to discuss mathematical truths. These are conceptual ideas that happen in the, main, in, in the mind rather than out, out there in the physical world. So science is, has, has a particular limitation. It's limited to the things that we can just observe directly or indirectly. Also, science is morally neutral. Morally neutral. Now, this doesn't mean scientists are immoral. Of course not. What it means is science cannot provide a basis for objective moral truths. Okay? There are some moral truths that we consider objective. And science cannot provide a foundation for this. Right? Because the only thing science can offer is the Darwinian mechanism or natural selection. But in the Darwinian mechanism via natural selection, what you see is that you, you, you cannot provide a foundation for objective moral truths. Why? Because our moral understanding has evolved as a result of biological conditioning. Certain, we were reared under certain biological conditions. And that's why... Darwin, he said, if we were to be reared under precisely the same conditions as the hive bees, we would think it's okay to kill off our daughters. Right? Because that's what hive bees do. Likewise, if we were reared under precisely the same conditions as the nurse shark, then we would think it's okay to rape our mates. That's what the nurse shark does. It bites the fin of its mate and it wrestles its mate. So this doesn't provide any objectivity to moral truth because moral truths, according to the science, are just are contingent, are dependent on inevitable biological changes. And you lose any moral meaning because the only meaning it has is, well, your moral value, the only meaning it has is that it was just a reaction to biological conditions. Okay, so it's amoral from that point of view. Science can tell you only what it is, it can't tell you what ought to be. For example, to everyone assess this reality. I get a knife and I cut open someone's chest and I cut some of their liver. Is this good or bad? Why is it bad? Maybe I'm a surgeon doing life-saving operations and I'm taking a tumor out of someone's liver. See? Science can tell you only what is going on. It can't tell you what ought to, to happen. Yeah? So science tells you, right, this is a reality. Here is a knife. It's sharp. It's cutting through skin. This is the physics of cutting through skin. This is the biology of blood uh, oozing out, for example. X, Y, and Z. It tells you what is happening. It doesn't tell you what ought to happen. Right? What ought to happen is we moralize, we rationalize, we discuss, we react to moral commands, yeah? Which is outside of the scientific method. Don't get me wrong, science can be used, science can be used maybe to infirm, you know, to give us some data so we could start to moralize, right? So we could start to think, okay, given that this is a particular reality and we have some of this information, this is our conclusion, right? Like the Prophet Sam did this when he was asked about the cohabitation with women who were breastfeeding. He said, I looked into the Romans and Persians. It didn't harm them, right? So he looked at their current science or what was happening. It didn't harm them. So he allowed it to happen, right? So we can use some data in order to form moral conclusions from that point of view. But the science itself cannot give you the foundation for those moral conclusions, okay? So, science cannot tell you why things happen. 
For example, if my auntie came here today and she baked a massive cake, an 18-inch cake, right? And she, then she just walked away. She didn't say anything, she didn't say hello, she didn't say salam, she just left. And then we have the cake right here on this stage. And I ask you the question, why did my auntie bake the cake? What would you say? Poison you. <laughs> it's just so she could poison you. <laughs> we can never know what her intention is. Exactly, you would never know. But if I asked you how did she bake the cake without asking her, would you know? Yeah. yeah, you would. If you're a scientist, you could actually take some of the cake, put it under a microscope, test it X, Y, and Z, and you can say, you know what? She used flour, she used egg, she used sugar, she used vanilla essence, blah, 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 blah and she baked the cake. Right? And that's how she did that. She did that 28, 208 degrees Celsius in the oven, or whatever the case may be. You could find that out just by testing the cake. But you would never find out why she baked the cake. So science tells you the how. It doesn't tell you the why. Now what we mean by why here is a purpose and intention for things, yeah? Which is very important. So this is why sometimes in a lot of discourse between secular people, people who are atheists, they conflate the how and the why. I remember when I was in Pakistan, I had a discussion with Professor Hudboy, and he was belittling the Quran, saying, oh, we know how earthquakes happen, it's tectonic plates, why is, your, why is God saying that it's because of, I don't know, sins or a test or whatever the case may be. I said, hold on a second, you just committed a massive log logical fallacy. You've conflated the how and the why, right? How earthquakes happen? Yes, uh, tectonic plates. But Allah is giving you the why. He's giving you the metaphysical reality of why these things happen. And they're not the same thing. Right? And I said, like, you know, when you have children, you know how babies are formed. There's, there's the blastocyst that formed and it goes into the neutrine wall. X, Y, and Z. I'm not an embryologist, but you get the point, right? Now, that's how. But why did it happen? Do you see the point? It's a different story. So there is conflation between the how and the why. And that's why, unfortunately, some neo-atheists say we should stop asking why. Because what we really mean is how. <laughs> you think it's funny? Richard Dawkins and Krauss actually said this in Australia. And I think it was specifically Krauss or Dawkins. One of them too, you could check this out. They were saying, you know, don't ask the why. What we really mean is the how, because they want to ignore these questions, because these questions have metaphysical implications, and these questions have answers of existential significance that science can't really answer. Right? Science can't deal with the personal. Now what? What do I mean by the personal? Well, take for example, me having this gourmet eight-shot espresso soy latte. I have one every morning. Yeah. That's all I need. Eight shots soy latte, right? Sorry, sir? Well, you don't know that. Do you know how it tastes? Exactly. Do you know how it tastes for me? No, because this is an inner personal subjective experience, right? An inner personal subjective experience. You will never know what it's like for Hamza to have an A-shot soy latte. Even if you had one, you will still never know. You'll know what it's like for you, but you'll never know what it's like for me. And this relates to the hard problem of consciousness in the philosophy of the mind. That you will never know what it's like for someone to have an inner subjective conscious state or inner subjective conscious experience. I mean, late last night we were talking with some of the Mashaya, talking about love. <laughs> it was quite cool actually. And, um, you know, we're talking about Rumi, what Rumi said about love. He said that when, when the pen was asked to write about love, it broke in two. And when Rumi said that lovers don't fall in love, they were already in love before they met. Yeah. Maybe in the primordial state when the souls were together, 
maybe you know, the two souls were very close to each other, right? You know, when Allah says to the souls, who is your Lord? And the souls reply, you are our Lord. And you know, the hadith that mentions that if you have an affinity for someone, it's because you are closer, right? So maybe lovers were actually really sitting together or sitting next to each other, right? And um, then it moved on to the Shafi fiqh. So there, there is an opinion in, in, in the Shafi tradition. Who's the Shafi today, by the way? There is an opinion in the Shafi in the, in the Shafi uh, madhab, which basically says that if you die of ish, ish is a possessive form of love. You, you know, it's like you're you're so in love, but it says she rejects you. For example, if you die, and by the way, physicists say that you could die of a heartbreak. Yeah, if you die in that state. There is an opinion that that person goes to paradise. They become a martyr. But there are some conditions that you don't talk about it, you don't express it, right? And if you die of heartbreak, then you're in eternal bliss in paradise. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. I don't think so. Who said that? No. Who said that? <laughs> Who said I don't think so? I said. Why? I just don't I just don't fathom it. It has not been part of my inner personal subjective conscious experience to be able to value that feeling. <laughs> yeah, well Allah blesses people with a soft heart, bro, and others he doesn't. <laughs> yeah, so what can I do, man? Yeah. Well I'm blessed. No, yeah, so not everyone has ish and ish is a hunja against us. Because it's it's ghost it, it's, it's Allah is telling us if you have that level of love for someone, then imagine what divine love is like. Imagine what the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is like, you know? And you know, when I, when I think about Allah's love, Allah is al-wudud, coming from the word wud, which means the loving that is giving. His love is pure because He doesn't need to love, right? Yet He loves. He is al ghani He is the free and the independent. Yet He loves and He gains nothing by loving. Imagine how pure that love is. Because a mother loves, but she has to love because it defines her. It fulfills her. Allah doesn't require fulfillment. But yet Allah loves. Imagine how pure that love is. Allah loves love. Yeah? And that's why for brothers and sisters, when you get married, then someone should love Allah. And it's through Allah's love that they find you. And if it's not that way, then it's going to be a disaster. Well, hopefully not, but you get my point. Yeah. That's why I always make dua, Oh Allah, and bring our family together in love via your glory. Yeah. It's a Sunday morning, man. <laughs> it's a Sunday morning. Alhamdulillah. So, can't test the person. It cannot address some metaphysical questions. So, what do we mean by me metaphysical? Remember, it's the first principle is the lens is important in our eyes in order to see and understand the world. Now, science, because of its development, is starting to address some metaphysical questions. For example, the beginning of the universe, you may have something to say about that. But generally speaking, science cannot deal with first principles or with certain metaphysical questions. For example, you can refer to consciousness. It can't answer the question why we have inner subjective conscious experiences arising from cold, non-conscious physical processes. This is an ontological question, and ontology is part of metaphysics. So ontology is about existence and about being. So, how can you have an inner subjective conscious state arising from cold neurobiological phenomena? This is a metaphysical question because you can't bridge that gap with science. Right? <laughs> they don't know. This is, part, this is another question of the hard problem of consciousness. They just don't know. They try and address it, but it's like, well, this is metaphysics. You have to allow the philosophers to discuss this. That's why one proposed solution is emergent materialism. Another proposed solution is functionalism or reductive materialism, whatever the case may be. I'm not saying they're strong solutions, but those solutions are philosophical in nature. Science can't give you those solutions. You need a, to develop a first principle, develop a lens in order to understand what's going on, and then you do the science. Right? Also, there are other sources of knowledge. You know, when someone says science, is the only way to form conclusions about the world and reality. 
They're assuming the scientific method is the only source of knowledge, which is terrible. If they study epistemology, the study of knowledge, they will know there are other sources of knowledge, like introspection, like your memory, like testimony. Testimony is a valid and fundamental source of knowledge. Professor C. A. Cody wrote in his book, Testimony, a Philosophical Study, in 1991, which was a landmark book that really revived the philosophical discussions on testimony, he basically argues that the say-so of others is actually fundamental to learning, even in science. I remember when I had a debate with Professor Lawrence Krauss, and I said to him, you have a metaphysical presupposition, meaning that you think every, all truth comes from observation. I said, that's false. And he said, yes it is, I just do the science. I was like, really? Well, do this science then. I said, do you believe in evolution? He said, yes. And I said, have you done all the experiments in the science yourself? No. And people laughed at him because they exposed the fact that he had to rely, he had to rely on the say-so of others. So testimonial transmission is key to knowledge. For example, if I ask the sister in the back of the brown and pinky jab, right? Both of them have been talking to each other while I've been speaking, yeah? So if I ask them a question, how do you know your mother gave birth to you, the one that you call your mother, what are you going to say? It's a very important question so we can iron out the concept I'm trying to articulate. And it will help you internalize it because you missed at least five minutes of it. <laughs> I'm asking, it's a valid question. How do you know the person that you call your mother gave birth to you? Brown and pink. Anyone? <laughs> Sorry, I don't know your name, so don't put it. Um, so, is your mother alive? Yeah. Do you know your mother? Yeah, I know. Good. Did she give birth to you? Yeah. This is a philosophical exercise. I do this all the time, so don't worry. It's not, I'm not trying to make a joke. Do you believe she gave birth to you? Yeah. Good. Prove it. Give me one answer and I'll open it out to the floor. Prove it. DNA. DNA, okay, good. Do you have a DNA test certificate at home? No. Your current belief that she gave birth to you is it based on DNA test? No, you don't have a DNA test at home. Even if you did a DNA test, it still wouldn't be empirical proof. It would be testimonial. I trust her. Yeah. Me, I trust her. What, what is trust? It's testimonial transmission. In actual fact, I'm going to be honest with you, you have zero scientific proof she gave birth to you. Zero. <laughs> if you find one right now, I'll get you a gift. I look like Sarah. Yeah, well, I look like, uh, like, uh, like, my, like my uncle. It doesn't mean, you know, I could look like someone else. I love her. You love her? Well, that's not testimonial. Yeah, that's, because uh, because uh, not yeah. because but good, this is off my head. So, can someone prove to me scientifically that their mothers gave birth to them? A truth that you would die for, right? You don't even have scientific evidence for. You don't have a DNA test certificate at home. Do you have one at home? No, but I, I do it in the lab. It's still You're going to do it in the lab? No, no. No, see, guys, please, wallahi, let's think before we talk, yeah? You can't make an assertion based on a hypothetical. You believe now she gave birth to you. The proof is not, oh, by the way, if I do this, it will give me the evidence. No, that is an assumption. You haven't done it. You don't have proof now. And the funny thing is, if you do a DNA test at home, or you take it to the lab, they're just going to give you a certificate which is testimonial transmission, unless you do it yourself, right? So, no one has done it themselves, so I want to know why the truth that you believe that your mom gave birth to you has some kind of scientific evidence. My assertion is, it doesn't have any scientific evidence. I have one question, even if you did do the test yourself, it's 96 or 97% accurate. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you're right. Come on. Does anyone, come on, don't you love your mother? Defend your mom, man. The point is, 
All we have is her say so, your dad say so, your experiences growing up. Now one would argue, oh, I have photos of the birth and the videos of the birth. I'm like, that's still testimonial transmission because you don't look the same then, right? You didn't catapult out of your mother's room with a beard and a suitcase and drugs. You look totally different. Someone has to say, hey, that was you, right? So therefore, the only evidence you have that your mother gave birth to you is testimonial transmission. This doesn't belittle the fact that your mother gave birth to you. I'm trying to show to you that we have sources of knowledge that give us certain reality, right? Even the world being round is testimonial transmission for many of us. We don't know the scientific evidence, we just have images which is testimonial, right? Even science, you need testimonial transmission. Science has become so complicated now, a scientist can't do all the scientific research, he or she has to refer to the data and experiments of someone else that they're not going to do themselves. So a key part of the scientific method is actually trusting the say-so of others as well. This is a value source of knowledge. So Professor C.A. Cody, he argued that testimonial transmission is not only useful, it is actually necessary, it's foundational. Because traditionally, David Hume, the Scottish skeptic, he said that we only agree with testimonial transmission, we only agree with testimonial transmission because it's, it, it's in line with our collective experiences. But Professor Cody says, hold on a second. How do you know what our collective experiences are? You only know through testimonial transmission. So he showed that testimony is actually fundamental. It's a fundamental source of knowledge. And there's a big discussion on this. It hasn't been popularized because people don't like it. Yeah? People are like, oh, you know, everything is provable. But most of the things that we believe to be true are actually testimonial transmissions, things you've just read in a book. Yeah? So for example, you have the likes of as Professor Benjamin McMiller, you have Dr. Elizabeth Fricker, Professor Keith Lehrer, uh, uh, Professor Cody, and many others. And there is a discussion on what constitutes testimonial transmission and if it's foundational. Don't get me wrong, testimonial transmission could be wrong. But just like our empirical understanding could be wrong. And there are rules and there are criteria what constitutes good empirical data and good testimonial transmission. That's not my discussion here. My discussion here is to show that testimonial transmission is actually fundamental. You need it for science, you need it for so, so much learning. In actual fact, in many of that university, you only learn things through testimonial transmission. Because you read in a book and you listen to the lecture. Yes, the lecturer said, oh, a study was done, but you didn't do the study. It's testimonial, you have, to, you have to take it yourself, right? Any questions so far? We've done the first assumption. Yes, sir? Uh, could you please explain philosophical naturalism? Uh, yeah. yeah, philosophical naturalism yesterday? Yeah, because recently you, uh, you said about <laughs> philosophical uh, naturalism. So that's fine, but sorry, I wanted to ask about methodologi methodologi methodological naturalism. Yeah, methodological naturalism is the view that if anything to be scientific, you just can't refer to God. You can't refer to God's power and divine activity. Which doesn't deny God. It says a scientific conclusion to be scientific cannot refer to God and divine activity. It doesn't say God doesn't exist. It doesn't say you can't believe in God. It doesn't say you're not allowed to believe in God. It may be saying, well, if something if something is going to constitute a scientific conclusion or a theory, it cannot refer to God, God's divine activity or power. You can do it from a metaphysical point of view. This is our metaphysics of the world. And the way Allah manifests His will is through physical causes that we can understand scientifically. Now I have to admit, in some schools of creed, that's a problem. But in other schools of creed, it's not a problem at all. And I don't have a problem saying that the world is full, full of physical causes. And Allah uses those causes to manifest His will. That's not a problem. Yeah. It's actually a problem if you adopt another view, which is that you know you have to connect these physical causes always directly to Allah. You know, you could do it in a metaphysical sense. This whole world is an interplay of divine names and attributes, and these physical causes are a manifestation of God's will. 
That's your metaphysic. And then when you're a scientist, you don't have to talk about God anymore. You say, well, this is how God does his stuff. Like Ibn and Ibn Hatham, right? When he did optics, he didn't really say, oh, look, Allah does this and that. He knew this is Allah's will. I'm just finding out how it happens via the physical world because Allah uses the physical cosmos in order to manifest his will. Right? So you could be a methodological naturalist and it wouldn't affect your iman. Yes? So what is their proof though? Like against, uh, how can they argue against the testimonial if they keep using the... Like, exactly. But like, I mean, then they lose the argument basically. Instantly. Yeah, but why do we not argue all the time? Have a conversation. Mm -hmm. No, but like, Which is usually going to be testimonial transmission. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, so they don't have an actual proof against this that any, anymore, like against the testimonial. No, they don't. I mean, some imprudent people will basically say, try and challenge it. Like I remember once some guy on Twitter, very, very unhealthy human being, in terms of his soul, who was one of those atheists online that, you know, also known as trolls, and. He was really angry at me. He was attacking me on this. I was like, listen, relax, man. It's like, yeah, I know China exists because of videos. Da, da, da. I was like, okay, well, that's testimonial transmission as well because you have to believe that video was done in China and that those people are Chinese. Do you see my point? So we need to revive this type, and it's very good for Islam. Because we have a very rich tradition concerning testimonial transmission. The preservation of the Qur'an, the ahadith, the isnad and the matan, criticism and analysis, the chain of narration and the text, you know? This is part, we have a very rich tradition concerning this. And I think we're a thousand years ahead of the West specifically on this phenomenon. Yeah? You know, it's really interesting for those who study ilm al-hadith, Take Emeritus Professor Keith Lehrer. He wrote a piece on what constitutes testimonial knowledge. This is this shit, yeah? He said, we have to be trustworthy in our assessments on the trustworthiness of others <laughs> in order for testimonial transmission to be valid testimony. Allahu Akbar. If you study uh, Ilm al-Rajal and Ilm al-Hadith, you see that you have to have biographies for people, they have to be known, they have to be trustworthy, blah, 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 right? It's very, very interesting. We're discussing these, these things now. So, yeah, so you can't run away from it. Alhamdulillah. So, second assumption. Oh, please, please question at the back. So my question is, uh, when we talk about testimony, isn't there a distinction with just a testimony and a testimony with strong evidence. Because if you but the headless is okay, you're just going by testimony, by a statement. Bring some evidence for it. Not really, because you're moving away from is testimony fundamental and a source of knowledge to what constitutes good testimony. I'm not talking about what constitutes good testimony. That's a different discussion. All you need to know now is well. Is testimony fundamental for science and for knowledge? Yes, we can't run away from it. Are there some good criteria to understand what constitutes good testimony? Yes. But we don't have to discuss that now. But even what you're saying is problematic because if someone gives a testimonial transmission and you ask for evidence, that evidence can only be relayed through testimony. <laughs> what are they going to do? I can show you? It's impossible. If, if you're going to talk about, for example, uh, the particle collider, it, 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 what you, what, what's that name? What's it called? What's it called? CERN. CERN, right? When particles are colliding. You don't want to redo that experiment in front of an audience of a thousand people, are you, right? This is not going to happen. You have to, here's the data, here's what we did. That's the only evidence you can show, right? And that evidence has been transmitted by what? Testimony. So your question refers to what constitutes good testimony and what constitutes knowledge from a point of view of testimony, which is a discussion that is going on. But the only thing you need to understand from a conceptual point of view is it's fundamental, it's required, you can't run away from it. And even science needs it too. Quick question. Um, if Science is about observable universe, right? Everything that's observed. And Allah is outside the domain of 
of being observed, right? So why are we trying to fix something that doesn't fit there? Absolutely, I'm going to mention this in, in the next few moments. Think about this. By definition, Allah is outside of the universe, right? If I create a chair, I don't become the chair. By greater reason, we're not doing analogies with Allah, that's not right, but by greater reason, it's the a fortiori argument, by greater reason, Allah is outside of the universe, right? Even using such terminology is problematic, but you, you get the point that creation is distinct and disjoint from the creator from that point of view. Given that is true, then science can't deal with God at all, directly. The only thing science can do is to keep quiet on the matter, or maybe in give you some evidence that you may infer that there is a designer. That's all it can do. It actually cannot, methodologically, it cannot disprove God. Methodologically, science cannot disprove God because it has to re re refer to direct or indirect observations and Allah is not observed from that point of view. Uh, but they do, do do that, right? So they call it God part, right? So, no, no, they don't. They so don't. what's God part? They don't, they don't. Why let's, be, let's be honest and fair, yeah? So, لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله Right. We need to be more red, okay? Don't, let's not listen to news articles about science or Google about science because you don't go to news article on Google when you want to buy a house or buy a car, alright? And this is why we need these sessions. I had someone email me saying his Iman was low. His Iman was low because they found the God particle. There was a popular magazine or article that basically said they found the God particle. Okay? Jazakallah right here for coming really late. So they found the God particle. So, and he said, my mind is low. I said, listen bro, what are you talking about? It is really more than three paragraphs, man. Or at least find the paper and just look at it. This particle had nothing to do with God. They had a theory that in the beginning of the early universe, all particles had no mass. And then the Higgs field was switched on. And it gave particles mass, apart from the photon. It gave particles mass. They theorized that in this that that the, in these uh, in this field there was a particle called and they called it the Higgs boson. The reason is called the God particle because originally they said it was too goddamn hard to find it, and because newspapers are lazy, they removed the damn and they said it's the God particle. Had nothing to do with God. Yet you'd be so surprised. On popular culture, social media, and the emails we were receiving and stuff, oh my god, they found the God particle. And this just shows how shallow we've become as a community. It had nothing to do with God. They found a particle that made up the Higgs field that was switched on in the early universe. Do you see my point? So, they don't do that. Um, it's only a popular culture. So, Although some people assume scientism, which we've just discussed, but we've dealt with that. Now, second assumption. Now, the second assumption is, well, science works, so it must be true. And if it's true, and science can't prove God, therefore God doesn't exist. Very fuzzy logic. But this will give you a really good concept to understand as well when dealing with philosophy of science and understanding science as it should be understood. So, they argue, Scientific conclusions are true at uh, work, therefore they must be true. Now remember, it is logically fallacious, fallacious to claim that just because something works, it has to be true. I repeat, there is no logical connection between something working and its truth value. I repeat, there is no logical connection between something working and it being true. Here's an example in scientific history. In the 1700s, they had this theory called phlogiston. The theory of phlogiston is that when things were combustible, things burnt, 
they would release phlogisticated air. Dan Rutherford in 1772 used this theory that seemed to be working to discover nitrogen. To discover nitrogen. They found the truth of nitrogen, right? It was working to the point where we even give you a truth, right? But then fast forward a few years, they realized that the theory of phlogiston was actually false. What does this show you? It shows you you can get a truth from a theory that is working that is actually based on a falsehood. <laughs> Alright? So, don't fall for that trap that if something works, therefore it must be true. And what's interesting, scientists are not really, they're not really concerned with absolute philosophical metaphysical truths anyway. This is why we still have Newtonian physics and we have quantum physics and they seem to be non-complementary paradigms. Because Newtonian physics works to a certain degree and things start to break down. Some would even argue even logic would start to break down. But they don't care. They say it works in this field, this sphere, and it works in this sphere. Let's continue. So, scientists are very practical. They want to know how things work, not necessarily the truth about things. Because that's a bigger, bigger discussion. So that's why, you know, they still, do, they still play with Newtonian physics and they, they do with the quantum world. And yet they still haven't found the link that bridges the two. Non-complementary paradigms. And that's why even Professor Elliot Sober, he says, false models can work better Sometimes better than ones that are true. <laughs> this is an atheist philosopher of science. False models can sometimes work better than true ones. And Samir Okasha, a philosopher of science, he says, historically there are many cases of theories that we now believe to be false, but were empirically quite successful. They were working, they were working, but now we know they're false. Assumption number three, science leads to certainty. Science can't prove God, and science leads to certainty, but it can't prove God, therefore you're uncertain about God, therefore God doesn't exist. Fuzzy logic, but that's one of their assumptions. So, the easy way to show that science doesn't lead to certainty is to talk about the problem of induction. The problem of induction, okay? Let's talk about the problem of induction. So, the problem of induction is as follows. You have a limited set of observations and you conclude for the next observation or for the entire set of observations. So you start from a known and you move to an unknown. <coughs> For example, if I observe a thousand white swans and I need to make a conclusion for the next swan that I haven't seen yet. I'm going to say the next one is what color? White. So if I've seen a thousand white swans and I have to conclude for one that I haven't seen yet, the next observation, I'm likely to conclude that the next swan is going to be white. But this is why you have a book called The Problem of the Black Swan. Because you have black swans, right? It could be the next one could be black. So your conclusions are probabilistic. They're never 100% certain. They range from zero to around 99%. Because you can always have another observation that contradicts previous conclusions. Even the evangelical atheist, Dar um, Richard Dawkins, who loves the Darwinian mechanism and promotes it, fair play to him. He says that in a few years' time, the Darwinian mechanism may drastically change. It may become unrecognizable to us because of new evidence, new observation. And that's the beauty of science. It's not supposed to give you this absolute truth. Things can change. Things can change. And don't forget, you also have paradigm shifts in, in science. You have eras of you have periods of time where there are fundamental paradigm shifts in the way we see and understand science. 
I believe that we're going to have one about on medicine very soon. You know, and I think it's creeping in. You know, the psychosomatic issues and 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 food and the way we look at food, right? Because even now, at the moment, you have the two number one. We were talking about smoking yesterday. If it's haram or not, yeah. You have this. Not that I, I'm not a fiqh person. I'm in my lane, but it was more moral philosophy, yeah. So I was speaking to the Mashiach, and one of the brothers was like, "Oh, smoking's bad for you because it harms you." I said, "Yeah, but can you use that as a premise to now make the conclusion that smoking is haram?" By the way, I follow smoking is haram, yeah. Just to be clear. I smoking. Smoking. smoking is haram. Yeah. I smoke. So smoking is haram. I smoke. No, I don't smoke. No. <laughs> Why would I smoke? Um, so smoking is haram. But however, the point is, you can't say it's haram just because it harms you, <laughs> because <coughs> there are other things that harm you the most. Like, what is the number one killer amongst Muslims and generally the, the Western populace? Yeah. The two number one killers is heart disease and diabetes. and diabetes, type two diabetes, I believe, right? Heart disease and type two diabetes, reversible diseases, reversible within three months. Within three months, if you stop eating absolute rubbish, within three months, your life has changed. This is well known in the scientific literature. Well known. Our lifestyle choices have harmed us to the point where we kill each other slowly. We slow suicide, right? Lung cancer is not the number one killer, right? Not the number one cause for death. Number one cause of death is heart disease and things like type two diabetes. Reversible phenomena, literally reversible. Just don't have oil anymore, right? Have more fruits and veg. Have oats in the morning. Don't have fried food. No refined foods. Don't have white rice. Have brown rice. Don't have white flour. Have brown flour. Easy peasy lemon squeezy stuff to change, right? So if you're going to just use the harm principle, then my God, your biryani is haram, right? Okay? And they say, oh, but it's been proven that one cigarette can cause cause damage. Yeah, but so can one burger. It hardens the arteries within 40 minutes. Right? So are you doing what about it by saying what about this, what about that? No, I'm not. I'm trying to show an inconsistency in a principle that's been used in order to develop your moral... Uh, 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 to, to, for, with the thing that you use for your moral philosophy. If you just focus on the harm principle, right, then so many other things are going to be really bad for you, bro. You see, how did we get here, by the way? Does you all know how we got here? Problem of induction, that's what we're saying. Ah, problem of induction, yeah, yeah. But I don't even know how we got there. But anyway, I thought I'd just bring that into the discussion because it's very important. You know, I wrote, I wrote a book called How Not to Die by Dr. Gregor, yeah? And um, he compiled all the peer-reviewed, he doesn't get paid for this, right? Peer-reviewed, double-blind studies, placebo-controlled studies that haven't been funded by the food industry. And it's phenomenal studies. Like my mom, right, she had a cholesterol level of over seven, to the point where she needed uh, medical intervention and probably she needed some kind of uh, medication, right? And she had a very high risk of probably heart disease, heart attack. <laughs> we brought it down by the healthy levels, like around five, within a few months, relative few months, just by making drastic so uh, lifestyle changes. Number one, no dairy. Number two, no sugar. Number three, oats in the morning. That's it, in a nutshell. The doctors were shocked. Yeah, because it's food. Even today, medics don't study food. I have a lot of friends in high-level positions. They're doctors, they're surgeons. They don't study nutrition properly. And I think there's going to be a paradigm shift on food and on the mind. Psycho, yeah, that's what we're talking about. So, psycho, psychosomatic effects. Because there are paradigm shifts in science, right? And when you study the placebo effect, 
you have a drug and you have the placebo. So the drug has a chemical compound, the placebo is like chalk. There is no chemical compound that creates any effect. And to find the efficacy of a drug, they give them the pill. Half of them would have no chemical compound inside, the other half would have the chemical compound, but they don't know. And for the drug to be accepted, it has to have a greater impact than the placebo. If the placebo has an impact, they throw the drug away. But look at it from another point of view. The placebo works. The mere fact that you believe something is going to be good for you, it's good for you. The, the power of the mind. We have decades of studies now of the effects of the placebo, which shows that the mind, your intentions, can heal you. The Prophet said, for every disease there is a cure, so search for the cure. We have a secular, reductionist paradigm on that hadith. Don't, don't, don't squeeze the words of the Prophet in, narrow, in a narrow fashion. The cure could be anything, right? Which could mean your intentions, your mind. Why do the senior business people, CEOs, they hardly get colds or flus? And if they do, it's 24 hours. Because they say, I don't have time to be ill. <laughs> That's what they say to themselves. I don't have time, I'm sorry buddy, you need to catch up. And then they do this stuff. The point is, the placebo, which means the very fact that your mind has intended. Like, the brain is very plastic now. If you look at neuroplasticity, you had people who reversed stroke. They reversed stroke. Just by intention. Yeah? Which, which, which is, is a really interesting, different take on the hadith that actually not important for the intentions here. Because in placebo, in, in, in stroke, you can't move, you can't act. But if you, re, if you rewire your brain and you have these focused intentions, you can start moving again, right? Obviously that has a different spiritual paradigm. I'm talking, you know what I'm saying, it's from the Tadabur point of view. So what I'm saying is, I, I really believe that the psychosomatic aspects are going to be a massive paradigm shift in, uh, in medicine. Isn't that epigenetic? Sorry? Isn't that epigenetic? I don't know, I haven't studied epigenetics that well. Yeah. But yeah, like your environment affects your genes, right? Yeah? Your information affects your genes. Yeah, your information, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. That's how the Sudha Fatiha could cure you. Well, the thing that is you. Absolutely. It so, you know what's interesting what the ulama say? They say, Rukya, like Surah Al Fatiha, will only work if you intend it for Shifa. If you don't have the intention, it's not going to work. Isn't that really interesting? And that's why you shouldn't really see these things from a scientific point of view because they're, they're spiritual. It's an ibadah, it's, it's an act of worship. That's why the ulama say it will only work if you intend it. Like cupping, for example, people have this cupping craze at the moment, yeah, which is good. But it's only going to work if you intend it. If you have the intention, it's going to work, right? So your intentions and your mind is so powerful. Allah has given it to us as a tool that we can reverse quite a few things, right? Like when you're when you're in the sporting world, you see how effective the mind is. People go through the pain barrier. They ignore pain. They transcend pain by pushing to the next level, right? So, yeah, the mind is a very powerful thing, you know? And language relates to mind. Like Allah says a good word, a bad word is like a tree that's uprooted that can't give any fruits. But a good word is like a good tree with deep roots and it has perpetual fruit, you know? And the way we speak to ourselves is through language, isn't it? And speak to others is through language. You know? So this is like the Quranic art of positive thinking. Have good words for yourself and you know, intend good things. Even how you acknowledge Allah, especially at a time of death. You know, at a time of death you don't think about punishment. It's actually it's not similar to do that. You give you good news. Allah is as you expect him to be. Hadith Qudsi. I am as my servant expects me to be. That's the Arabic, your expectation. If you expect good from Allah, you'll find him in your best of expectations. It's as if our, 
akhirah is dependent on how we see Allah. Husn 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 adhan billah. Do you have the you know good thoughts about Allah Subhanahu wa Taala? You know, and that's why sometimes when you have a very negative person that always focuses on death, destruction, this and the other, their spirituality is like that too, and the way they see Allah is like that too, right? But we need to be more balanced, yeah. Anyway, the point is, to cut a very long story short, there are paradigm shifts in science, right? So, there is no certainties. You could have paradigm shifts, and because of the problem of induction, you can have another observation that, is a, that, it, that contradicts your conclusions that are based on limited, limited observation. And interestingly, you know, Karl Popper, he said, you know, you, science, you, you need to have falsification, right? If it can't be falsified, it's not scientific. And if it's falsified, then you shouldn't use it. And I, this is actually wrong, because in academia, no one is a hard preparing anymore. They're soft preparings if they're going to be, if they're going to follow Karl Popper. Because Karl Popper basically, in a nutshell, was saying, that you know your theory has to be uh, falsifiable, which means that the, 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 there should be an evidence, a negative evidence that actually shows that your theory is to be false. Because Popper knew that there was a problem of induction, and he said theories can't be proven true, but they can be proven false, right? So, for example, you have a theory that all birds uh, will die on a Friday in mid-flight. That's falsifiable because. You can, there could be a possibility of another observation that contradicts your theory. That there could be a bird that dies on Thursday walking, right? So that theory has been falsified. But even when you do that, falsification is not the end of the story because you can revive falsified theories if you change the assumptions. For example, how do you think they discovered Neptune? So they had a really good theory about what orbits were doing. And then they saw the orbit of Uranus, it had perturbations, it was wobbly. There was a wobbly orbit of Uranus. If they followed the Karl Popper's understanding of science, they would say, right, our understanding of orbits is, 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 is completely gone. But they didn't do that because they had so well confirmed data. What they did was they changed the auxiliary assumptions. They said, well, maybe there's another planet. And you know what? Then they found the other planet was Neptune because it was affecting the orbit of Uranus. Which goes to show, when people say, ah, oh, has it been falsifiable? It's not entirely true, because falsified theories can be revived if you change the assumptions. Now, one would argue here, Hamza, isn't there a contradiction between problem of induction and Islamic sources? Isn't there a contradiction between the problem of induction and Islamic sources? Don't we use induction to preserve Quran and Hadith? Well, there's a difference between inductive reasoning and inductive arguments. Science uses an inductive argument. It takes limited data and it concludes for the unknown. Islam doesn't take a limited data and conclude for the unknown. It uses inductive reasoning from the point of view of using certain observations or even senses, like hearing something, and it just mirrors the sensation. It doesn't conclude for the unknown. For example, in hadith, you would, you would hear that one Sahabi would say, I heard the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say, Al-Mu'minu Miratul Mu'min The believer is a mirror of another believer. So he heard this, he just mirrored his senses. He mirrored the observation, he, he mirrored what he heard. This is inductive reasoning. I heard X, therefore X. Inductive argument is, I heard X, Therefore, why? Right? So even in the preservation of the Qur'an, when a Sahaba would hear, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ They didn't say, I heard the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ Therefore, Alif <laughs> He wouldn't do that. He wouldn't jump and conclude for the unknown. He would just mirror what he heard. So this is not a contradiction. Because it doesn't mean you now have to be uncertain with the Islamic sources because it's, it's, it's not inductive argument, it's an inductive reasoning. You hear something. And especially when you study the concept of Mutawatir, which is recurrent reporting, 
which is so many transmissions that people claim it's false is to be absolutely irrational. But we could discuss that later. But the point is, if someone says, hey, don't you guys use inductive arguments to preserve your tradition? No, we don't. It's inductive reasoning, which is different from inductive arguments. Inductive reasoning is when you observe something or you sense something and you conclude for an unknown. Inductive, so inductive arguments is when you observe something and you conclude for an unknown. Inductive reasoning is when you observe or sense something, you just mirror what you observe. For example, I have seen four people in this room, therefore there are four people in this room. That's it. I have seen ten black crows, therefore some crows are black. That's fine, because it's true, you've seen ten, it's sum of an amount. You just mirrored your senses, you mirrored your observation. So, finally, Philosophical naturalism. Now we did this yesterday. So another false assumption is that people say that hey, um, people say that well, those who claim that science is to atheism they conflate philosophical naturalism with methodological naturalism. Just to repeat, methodological naturalism is the worldview, the philosophy that there is no divine, no supernatural. Everything can be explained by physical processes. Methodological naturalism is that for something to be scientific, you cannot refer to divine power or divine wisdom. Now, they conflate the two. They conflate with the idea that there is no divine with the idea that you can't, sh you can't refer to the divine in scientific conclusions. They're two different things. And that's what some people do when they say that science is to atheism. They are assuming a non-scientific philosophy of philosophical naturalism. And this is very important for you to really tease out in these conversations because they have an assumption that there is no divine anyway and everything can be explained by physical processes, right? Which is just an assumption. And that's why the evolutionary biologist, he said, look, of course the scientist as an individual is free to embrace a reality that transcends, that transcends methodological naturalism. So you could be a scientist and agree with methodological naturalism that scientific conclusions cannot refer to God's divine creativity or power, but it doesn't follow now that you don't believe in God. It doesn't follow now that you have to adopt philosophical naturalism, which is the philosophy that there is no divine, no supernatural, and everything can be explained by physical processes. They are two different things. So, some people, they have the false assumption to say, well, since science is not allowed to conclude anything about God, therefore God doesn't exist. But that's fuzzy logic. You're conflating two things together. You're conflating a philosophy with a method. The method is saying, fine, don't refer to God in your conclusions. But it doesn't now follow, therefore God doesn't exist. Right? So the next point is, finally, before we go for a break. Well, science doesn't need to eat this as we just discussed, because science is based on those four, four assumptions we've just unraveled. Well, what about the next question we're addressing? Science disputes religious claims. The easiest way to deal with this is very simple. Is to focus on the problem of induction. Because Yes, there's going to be a contradiction between revelation and scientific conclusions. We, we know this in history. In the 19th century, for example, you had Muslims that believed the universe had a beginning, correct? It's actually kufr to believe that the cosmos has no beginning, right? Because it's like you're equating the eternality of the physical world with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So Muslims believed that the universe has a beginning. Cosmos, creation has a beginning. But in the 19th century, they believed the universe had no beginning. The scientists believe in the steady state theory. So what do you do? If you always want science to agree with the Quran, then what would you do in the 19th century? Disagree with the science and throw an, or, or agree with the Quran? Or Disagree with the Quran and agree with the science. 
But it's not that simple, it's not either or. So, the whole argument assumes that science is certain and it's not in flux and it's always going to be the same. But as we know from the problem of induction, you can have another observation that can contradict your conclusions based on limited observations. This is the problem of induction. So, let's use the Darwinian mechanism as a case study. The Darwinian mechanism, and by the way, I want you to, to understand there is a difference between direct observations and science. Like when I see the moon is round, that's not science. That's a direct observation. That's an observable fact. Don't conflate observable facts with science. Science refers to scientific conclusions and theories. Direct observable facts is not science. Science uses direct observable facts, and many of them, to understand what's going on, but science is not just the observation of one direct observable fact. Right? So yes, it would be a problem if direct observable facts contradicted religion. But they don't. Right? Like you don't hear, see in the Quran, the Quran says that the moon is a diamond. <laughs> you just don't see that. right? So, let's use the Darwinian mechanism as an example. Evolution in, in a nutshell, is biolo biological change. Biological change, yeah? Evolution is biological change. So evolution is biological change, and the Darwinian mechanism explains that change. According to some interpretations of orthodoxy, or orthodoxy says that we can't agree with one aspect of the Darwinian mechanism, which is the common ancestry, because it contradicts the ijma of the ulama and the classical tradition concerning the origins of humanity. In this case, Adam alayhi salam. So we have a problem. What do we do? There seems to be a contradiction. It is a contradiction because the Darwinian mechanism is more of a fact, inverted commas, than the Big Bang. Right? So what do we do? We can't just say, oh, it's just a theory. By the way, if this is just a theory, please don't do that anymore. It's absolutely embarrassing. Let's not do that anymore, yeah? Because the theory in science is actually very well confirmed. For something to be even considered a theory, it's a very well confirmed thing that people use. Okay? It's very, very important to consider that. Because if something reaches to the level of a theory, it means you need to take it very, very seriously, yeah? So, we need to make, because it, it, online there's a lot of things going on and it's an embarrassment. You can't just say, no, oh, it's just a theory. Well, so is Big Bang just a theory. And so are many, many things just a theory. Things that you're using to try and prove the Quran in the first place. What a contradiction, yeah? Anyway, so, Darwinian mechanism is the best that we have in the scientific community. It's more, one of the most well-confirmed things that we have. And we have an apparent contradiction with religious discourse. So what do we do? Well, it's very simple. If you know what we've just gone through now in terms of the philosophy of science, you can reconcile it without reconciling it. You just do it from a practical point of view. So how do you reconcile it? Well, the way to reconcile it is by saying, fine, I believe in the Qur'an, I have evidence for the Qur'an, and I believe that the source of the Qur'an is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So therefore, this is this the, the knowledge of the Quran is from the divine. So it's in my creed, it's in my aqidah, it's in it's what I believe to be absolutely true, the Quran. Alhamdulillah. On the other hand, we have science. We have science, right? Science is not absolutely true. We already discussed this. Even Richard Dawkins is saying in ten years or in a few years' time, we may have the Darwinian mechanism that could look totally different, right? So you could accept the Darwinian mechanism practically with a proviso. It's the best that we have as a scientific community. It's based on limited data. We still don't know much about the ocean, right? We still don't know much about, about genetics. Things are changing drastically. There are some disputes going on. But it's still the best that we have. It's the pixel within the picture. We can't deny it because we can't provide an alternative scientifically. So that would be a very silly thing to do. Even if you think it's weak, you can't reject it based on its weakness unless you have an alternative. You don't have an alternative, right? 
So you accept it practically and you use it because it works. And remember, if things work, it doesn't mean they're true. But it works and you can develop antibiotics and save lives as Muslims should do. So you accept it practically. But you don't bring it into your Aqidah. Khalas. So the problem. You don't have to reject any of them. Quran's in your Aqidah. These are your metaphysical beliefs. These are your beliefs, to, you know, to be absolutely true. It happens to be at this point of history in the progression of human civilization, we have come to a conclusion based on our limited data and understanding that the Darwinian mechanism is, is the thing that is working and the thing that best coherently explains our data. From an Islamic point of view, we're saying, well, we know that's not absolutely true because there's a contradiction with the Quran. But we could accept it practically as Muslim scientists without putting it into your creed. And there you go. So you say, so someone said to me, do you believe the Darwinian mechanism to be true? I was like, no, it's not true in an absolute metaphysical philosophical sense. But practically, it works. Practically, I'm not going to deny it. It's the best that we have. But I know science can change and you may have a future observation or a paradigm shift that could really drastically change our understanding of the Darwinian mechanism. But I'm still accepting it because the best that we have, I'm not going to be that pugnacious to say, oh, forget it. No, because scientists are practical and, you know, if, if it works and it's allowing us to produce antibiotics and save lives, let's keep on using it, no problem. But I don't have to accept it in my creed. I can accept it from a practical point of view rather than from a creedal point of view. With the proviso that it can change, with the proviso that you don't accept it as absolute and that you accept the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I think that's the easiest way forward. So if anyone comes with some kind of science and says, look, it disproves religion, because there could be things in cognitive science that could disprove religion. So what? Big deal. Allah has the picture, we've just got the pixel. Our scientific journals and papers and theories have assumptions, are based on probabilities, and there are some disputes in academia. And that's why we have to really be mature. Why do we think, just because a new paper of theories come along that seems to dismantle religion or contradict it, that we get so shocked? It's bound to happen because we're always going to have a limited understanding of reality anyway because our scientific conclusions and theories are based on probabilities, based on philosophical assumptions that we can't even really prove, and they're based on disputes. It's called PAD, P-A-D. All scientific theories are based on probabilities, meaning you don't have all observed phenomena, right? You have a limited data. Number two, they're based on philosophical assumptions, like the Darwinian mechanism is based on the philosophical assumption of gradualism. And number three, there are some disputes about certain areas in academia, like you have most, in, in most things. So why would you even take that as a challenge to your aqidah that you believe to be absolutely true? Why would you do that? And this is the easiest way of dealing with these issues. So do the science, be practical, save lives, and believe in Allah. That's why I was in Hyde Park once, Speaker's Corner, which I rarely go to, and some atheists was like, oh, the scientists say that the Quran says this. No, you guys say the Quran says this, but science says this. I was like, so what? I said, the science absolute. Do you have all the observations of a particular phenomenon? No. Can there be a possibility of a new observation that contradicts your conclusions? Yes. Okay, fine. And then he just, he just stood silent. That's it. Easy peasy, then it's squeezy.